Okay, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it for waiting for me, <laughs> the last speaker. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my thesis dissertation and first of all, a little bit about me. I uh, am a PhD in computer science in UCLA. My advisor is Dimitri Terzopoulos. Um, and uh, okay, let's, let's just start in here, what I have to say. So the focus of my research is basically kind of uh, bridging the gap between physical and virtual reality. And when I'm talking about bridging the gap, I'm talking about both animation and modeling. So both animation and modeling are kind of critical in computer graphics and CGF at large. So let's kind of uh, zoom in on what, are, what I'm exactly talking about. So when I talk about animation and modeling, I'm talking about focusing on crowd simulation under animation and focusing on computational design of interiors under modeling. And the thread that connects these two uh, research areas are fast and scalable methods. How the, can we empower fast users with fast and scalable methods so they can get where they want to go? So, uh, okay, let's start with modeling, and we're going to talk about computational design of interiors in modeling, which is a kind of crucial task in, say, every computer game, for example. So when we talk about modeling in the real world, not in graphics, we have these artists who spend a lot of time kind of painstakingly carrying out their models, either it could be like a, some kind of statue over here or some kind of architectural model over here, and this takes many, many days, and they put in a lot of love and care to make them perfect. So in a computer graphics world, obviously we have some software that can design these models for us, but still it takes a lot of hours and many time and effort to get that going. So just to imagine the cost, just to put a number on this effort, so say designing this building takes say 12 hours, like just the texturing another 10 hours, final pass another 22 hours, so that can be maybe $3,900 in the salary of some artist you want to employ for creating your game. And we fix, we extrapolate these costs into the entire scene, so we can say this trash can cost $3,500, a trash big trash $5,000, and so on. The building six thousand. So all of this scene might, you know, cost $200,000 just to create. So this is like just putting numbers on the effort it takes to create like good-looking game or whatever. Are you the hero character? <laughs> I'm trying to be. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. So um, let's move on. So this is just kind of putting numbers of the big uh, cost of that it takes to model these scenes. So now we obviously have this like nice uh, software that you can use to create scenes, and it's not perfect, but it gets you where you want to go. However, you still need to take a lot of time to create it. Might not be the best software, but it works. So the idea is how to kind of uh, shortcut this design process. So instead of like say just manually creating all the scene, maybe you can use some automatic generation algorithms to shortcut this for you. And this, of course, this significantly reduces the time it costs to create scenes. And this will allow us to make large scale layouts tractable. It was not uh, the work that we had previously, and I'll show you why. So, uh, in this paper that was published at TPCG, I'm going to attack this uh, problem. So, first of all, when we kind of deep dive into interiors, we see we have some arrangement here. But if we focus on it a bit more, we notice there are some constraints that we can define geometrically. So, we can, for example, define the distance constraint between a chair and a table over here. Uh, some distance between the span and the wall. Uh, there's another, like, we don't want any overlap, say, between the sofa and the plaques. And we also want some aesthetic layout constraints, between, so this kind of layout will be pleasurable in some way. So all of these are geometric. So uh, maybe we can use some machinery from other areas in graphics to kind of synthesize this scene for us automatically. So luckily, uh, in physics-based animation, uh, there is work on exactly this kind of problem. So it's called position-based dynamics. And the idea is how to kind of simulate in real time many, many uh, particles, say 10,000. And the idea is like you can just define all of the constraints of the system geometrically, and you can use the machinery to optimize the scene for you. So obviously, it's not as simple as that. And, uh, but to kind of give you a bit more taste of what's happening here, so like say the carpet here has like a number of particles, and the carpet, the particles here just have distance constraints between them, and by kind of stretching and and uh, and like moving around, and by optimizing for that cost, we can just make it look real. So it will be not be exactly real, but will be good enough for this uh, scene. Uh, by the way, let me know if you have any questions. I know this is the last uh, round, and everyone is tired, but. I can try to accommodate you as much as I can. So uh, let us look at the machinery over here. So we have a chair and table, and we want to observe this distance constraint between them. 
So we can say that this we want this constraint to hold for this layout to be happy, a happy layout. And uh, if we deep dive, and I'm going to just like deep dive a little bit into the math here, so I don't want to uh, bore too much. But say we can just use a Taylor expansion of that constraint, and our goal is to find this uh, correction over here. And if we uh, want to find this correction, the correction is uh, a gradient of this constraint by some multiplied by some scalar. So now we need to figure out what the scalar is. And we can figure out the scalar just by copy pasting, which is the typical thing we do as in computer science. So this is obviously not the full uh, picture of what's happening here, but this will just give you the taste of the simple uh, PBD uh, optimization approach. And uh, once we get that, we get this scalar, we can just copy paste it back here. We, have the, we can just derive the gradient based on the constraint that we define. And we have all the numbers, and we can just run the algorithm. So, and we can get something like this in a few seconds, for example. So here we have a number of tiers. Each tier has a number of chairs. The chairs are kind of have some distance constraint to the stage. And this is, this is like something that's easily synthesized um, with our machinery. Quick clarification yep. there. Um, are fire regulations one of the constraints? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can add them. So you can, you can figure out uh, if there should be, say, um, how close should the chairs be, say, to an exit? That's well, actually, like. it's aisles. <laughs> aisles, yes. And the of rows. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can add aisles, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that actually we have. Uh, uh, any other questions? So did this scene, you have the distance between the chairs already. Is yeah. it like you were trying to remap it to a different scene? or like? So basically, you're taking noise. Mm -hmm. You're taking all of these chairs are like randomly distributed in this scene, mm -hmm. but you and you know that you want 30 chairs in this tier, 30 chairs in this tier, 30 chairs in this, tier. and you just say I want them in some distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, you're not you're not saying uh, exactly what the distance should be between each chair. You're just saying I want them to be at some distance to. You can have the other way. You can have the distance between the chairs. I do show that in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, that's even easier if you think about it that way. Yeah. Um, but it's not the layout that a, uh, a theater design would have come out. Well, we can argue about that. So I, I think uh, if you're talking to a theater designer, there might be many more things a theater designer might think of, like say viewing angle, uh, say like sound. Uh, if you can come up with a geometrical way to describe these, then I think you can use this machine. Other questions? We're good? OK. So, um, just kind of to give you a comparison with previous work. So previous work employed this like stochastic, probabilistic way of kind of sampling layouts and finding some energy so it will be the best layout uh, globally, you can say. The downside of this work is it takes a lot, long time because it doesn't employ any gradients. It just samples layouts randomly. Mm -hmm. Another downside of the previous approach that I'm preparing against is uh, there could be collisions. So here we don't actually see the collisions, but in the other work, if you get like you can you just sample, 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 and you can just get situations like this where your probabilistic algorithm will get stuck. In. So and you cannot. This is obviously not super realistic, but if you if you had red information, you could easily kind of avoid this uh, kind of black hole. Okay. So. Um, some more results. So we had our picnic scene, our stage scene. And um, so obviously, this looks really nice. Uh, and like, OK, what we can, can we use this machine really for? So other than like just synthesizing virtual layouts, uh, one idea is you can take pictures of a real layout and kind of synthesize things inside them. So a user, say, can take a picture, and he can imagine how his like, interior or exterior would look like with these virtual items. And this uh, piece we published in the uh, SCB PR workshop last year. So we dealt with uh, layouts, but the problem with layouts is there's no real way to kind of understand if they're good, bad. It's very kind of, um, it depends on the user, right? It's like there's not, no clear metrics to decide what should we be looking for. However, this machinery we can use for a different problem, which is crowd simulation. So we do know good metrics on how crowds should move like, and, and we do know how to, how to actually do it with this um, machinery. So let's take a look. First of all, 
why are we at all interested in crowds? So one problem in crowd simulation is we want to understand human motion. Why are humans moving around in this way? How are they kind of accommodating each other in a way that doesn't disturb uh, other people? So obviously we, he, we have a lot of people moving here and there's no collisions. Everything seems fine, stable. Now imagine you want to place a robot here and the robot needs to interact with these people. How can you design an algorithm that will tell the robot how to interact, how to go, what to, it's very difficult. So you want to understand this concept of human motion. Another thing you're interested in if you're simulating crowds is, uh, say, escape. So you have like a fire, earthquake, whatever. You want to know how many people you can evacuate as quickly as possible from the building. So of course, you can do experiments and such. Uh, but that's like one thing you need to know if you're, if you're studying crowds. How many people can I safely evacuate from the building in case of an emergency? Obviously, we have them in robotics, as I mentioned before. If you have a robot, say you have an Amazon warehouse, many, many robots roaming around. How do you tell these robots not to collide with, other, with each other and also with humans who are like in that warehouse? So there's different approaches here, but obviously this is very important if you're, if you're designing an autonom autonomous warehouse like this. And finally, in graphics, uh, we of course you see crowds all the time in games, in movies, and so on. So why are we actually interested in simulating crowds? We have all of this uh, kind of nice aspects. So you cannot easily gather 200, 300, 400 people and like, just tell them run, right? That's not so easy to do. All these extreme situations, you cannot easily simulate panic. You can not tell someone, okay, now you feel panicky. And like, that, that's not like, a real thing. So you need to also avoid harming participants, right? So you don't want having participants just like, kind of scramble over each other when they're trying to flee some scene which is actually like an experiment. So all of these are good reasons for why we're interested in this kind of problem. Okay, so um, a test case for a crowd simulation is a scenario like this where we have, say, 100,000 people kind of just crossing each other. And how can we efficiently get them across safely without having any collisions or any kind of uh, thing affecting their motion? So uh, uh, with this paper, I kind of attacked that problem. So the idea here of this work was to provide a fast and scalable way of simulating crowds. And before I dive into what exactly I did, let's kind of overview the previous work in this area. So we have kind of very top level work on how to simulate agent, a crowd as agents. So each agent is an AI, he has some beliefs, some uh, energy, he wants to eat food, he goes to eat food. I kind of think of the Sims game. And another approach is simulating crowds as particles. So agents are very dumb. They have some kind of global forces that locomote them towards where you want to go. And that the whole crowd system emerges according to that, uh, to these forces. So kind of quickly overview, uh, very old paper of my advisor, but not that old, but still. Uh, we have, we have a... <laughs> He's younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a tortilla. <laughs> anyway, we see here Penn Station, not the new Penn Station, the old Penn Station. And we see all these kind of AI agents moving towards uh, the entrance and inside. And we can see this nice lane formation, which is actually like a good behavior you want to see if you have a proper crowd simulation algorithm. The other approach is uh, a Boyd's algorithm, which uh, is, this is not original rendering, of course, so this is from 1987. But, uh, so what happens here, you have these fish, and you have a couple of forces that affect the, these fish so they can go happily where they want to go. Or you have an obstacle avoidance force, you have a neighbor, neighbor attraction and detraction force, and a falling force, and so on. And all of the system kind of easily emerges uh, from this simulation. So why can't we just use that? Why can't we just use that? Uh, I'm going to get to it soon, but let's okay. Let's say for computational efficiency, we're going to pick this approach, the particle-based approach, and we can see where it gets us. So the idea is again just getting back to the problem statement: we want to simulate 100,000 agents, we want it to be easy to implement control, we want to have stable collision avoidance. We don't want to have any collisions between agents, and we want it to work both for dense and sparse crowds. What do I mean by dense and sparse crowds? I'll, I'll show you soon. But this is obviously very dense; like there's not a lot of room to move. So uh, if we take the Boyd's uh, work and we look at the state of the art in particle-based crowd simulation, which uh, was uh, proposed by Karamuzas et al. by 2014, we can try to get this kind of same scenario working in that scene. So why, why does it not work? Let's see. 
So here I took uh, that method and I had two uh, kind of crowds kind of just trying to cross each other. As you can see, like in the beginning, it seems fine. Uh, nothing crazy is happening. But as we move forward in the simulation, there are a lot of overlaps happening over here. And this is not a good behavior. Why are these overlaps happening? They're happening because this is a force-based explicit method. And to make this kind of resolve these collisions, you have to take a smaller and smaller time step. So obviously, as you take a smaller and smaller time step, it's going to be less computationally efficient. It's not going to be real time. And you're not going to get this kind of interactive behavior, which is bad. So uh, getting back to our machine way of using PBD. So in PBD, we know how to kind of make these two uh, agents or particles at distance D from each, from each other. We also know how to make them uh, not be close to each other. So if we just put agents in the particles like this, so we can approximate these agents with these disks. And then we can just say, OK, given these uh, agents, we want this constraint to hold throughout the entire simulation. And by just taking this uh, approach, we can see what, what's going to happen. So here's like a very simple example. So they just kind of just kind of cross each other, and they kind of slide across each other, and they go to the other, you know, to where they're going. This is not a real you know, crowd, but this is a start. So let's see where this takes us. So if we scale this, we can see this entire group of people trying to go to the other side. <laughs> And we can obviously see some compression with real world footage. We have this arc here, which is a good thing, because this arc is what crowd researchers are interested in seeing in a crowd simulation model. So this is this is okay. This gets us somewhere. Obviously, we had some some uh, questions though. So the question is how to actually efficiently avoid collisions, kind of long range collisions between the agents. So here we have two agents walking along some path. And they're obviously going to collide at some point. So one way you can use this other constraint, you can just attach some ghost uh, particle to each of these agents. And as these ghost particles collide, whatever happens here, you just project back to the agent. The question is, uh, at what distance should you do it? So it could be it could be any distance. It could be arbitrary. It could be some uh, you know. It could be dependent on the scenario. So instead of looking at this distance, we're just going to always look at these possible collisions. And the idea is the closer the, the agents are to collide time-wise, the stronger this avoidance behavior will be. And what do I mean by that? We have an example here. So here, the tau parameter is the time to collision. So the higher the tau, the farther away they'll try to kind of avoid the collision. OK, and let's, uh, let's kind of dive deep back what's happening here. So we have both agents, they're colliding, and this is their, where they're going to be in the next time step. And this is the kind of overlap they have to resolve somehow. And by just moving them forward or backward, depending on this uh, point, this kind of uh, uh, segment within the center of the agents, we can adjust this uh, collision avoidance. So um, one thing to notice is the agents moving this way. And this is the response vector, say, or this is what the constraint will do to the agent. So there's also another component over here. So if you look at this vector over here, it's moving against the velocity of the agent. So that means the agent will slow down, because we're kind of, kind of hypothesizing of some future and then acting on it now. So maybe we don't want to do it. Maybe we just want to take this component, which will just avoid uh, the collision without slowing the agent down. So this is how we came up with two models, which I call the avoidance model and the long-range collision avoidance. And we can see how this affects the agent. But first of all, let's start with a simple long-range collision comparison. So the blue agents here have the old uh, the short range collision, and the red agents have the long-range collision. So obviously, this works fine. Uh, the agents are avoiding the collision. Let's see how this scales. So here we have the long-range model and the avoidance model. And you can see different behavior. So if you have the long range model, the agents kind of split into groups in lanes. And here, the entire group moves as a huge chunk kind of to avoid the collision. And we can just take this farther, and you can see how this scales on a different deep level of detail. So here, we have the long range collision model, the avoidance model. Here, we have kind of these lanes forming. However, they seem to get stuck here. Here, not so much. They kind of form bigger chunks and are able to pass. And if we take this up the next level of resolution, so we have um, 
we have this high count simulation over here and here, about 10,000 agents. So here we have this kind of interesting kind of big thick lanes. And here they seem to get stuck, but after some time, believe me, they'll like manage to get through to the other side. Have you tried this with humans? Uh, we can. Do you have? Do you know ten thousand humans? Who <laughs> 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 can volunteer for the harmless experiment? Um, so uh, that basically, how all of this, how all of this works in real time. So first of all, we need to use two special hashes for collision detection. We have to use CUDA. Uh, if we didn't have CUDA, it would not be real time for say even hundreds of agents. And we can also, since we're using PBD, which is a very known, a well-known framework for physics-based animation, we can use other PBD constraints like cohesion and friction. So cohesion makes agents more cohesive, move as more as one. Friction kind of slows them down as they're kind of more close to each other. Uh, we can combine all these position corrections. Obviously, since the agents want to clamp the velocities, so we don't want to have like agents kind of fire away. So we do all of this within this framework. And uh, to conclude uh, what we saw till now, we saw a position-based collision avoidance framework. We combine a GPU. This is an alternative for force-based methods that we saw before. It's stable with large frameworks and easy to implement in games. So I don't know if you know, but Unreal Engine, Houdini, and all of these other frameworks that uh, entertainment companies use all use PBD. So they can easily use our uh, machinery to, crowd sim to do crowd simulation. And last but not least, this one, Best Paper Award in ACMC Graph Motion with Games. Mm. Uh, there's also another work that extends this paper, uh, which basically has more examples, more metrics, uh, more measurements of how to compare this to other works. And uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to quickly mention other work we did this year on, in CGraph about simulating human motion. Uh, uh, the idea was how to have a deep network kind of uh, shortcut the IK process of having a human move his hands around to kind of respond to when the ball kind of tries to come to it. Also legs and so on. And uh, last but not least, uh, just future research that I'm kind of interested in working on. Um, so this is my favorite movie, it's called iRobot. And in this movie you can see humans moving around in Chicago, 2035. You can also see robots moving around. So the idea is how can you actually think of some algorithm some uh, way to have these robots and humans walk around closely to each other without any collisions. So obviously you can't just have humans now walk near to robots, that's not safe, but how do we get there? So that's kind of the big arching goal of this crowd simulation work in my opinion. Another thing I'm interested in is uh, game engines and game, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the gaming industry profit has overshadowed all of the other entertainment industries. So gaming is a huge thing. And how huge, it's, it's about $116 billion. And if you look at the trajectory of gaming industry, this is an exponential curve, by the way. It's going to, like, it decreases, basically exponentially. So this is going to be a huge thing. And uh, you're gonna, we're going to have a lot of challenges, both in terms of content generation and both in terms of game simulation technology to power up these kind of machineries. So, and also last but not least, VR is even more kind of uh, powerful for games and so on. So how do we generate all these contexts for VR? How do we like power these simulation experience in the VR and so on? So this is kind of the research um, future that I see. And last but not least, thank you. Uh, I have another stop.